Greetings from Brother Stephen. I'm a disciple and witness of Yahashua Christ. To all the inhabitants of the earth, I present to you as a witness this gospel of the kingdom. In this lesson titled Blessed are the Peacemakers, we'll be covering Matthew chapter 5 verses 9 through 12. And basically this lesson is all about defining what a peacemaker is biblically. biblically. And we're going to get right into the lesson. Um, Matthew chapter 5 verse 9 it says blessed are the peacemakers now this word peacemakers come from a Greek word pronounced ernapoias and this word only appears once in the entire Bible um, ernapoias comes from two other Greek words the first one is erna which means peace between individuals or groups of people and poyas, which means bring forth, produce or make. And this is how we get the translation peacemakers. But today we have a much better word that we can use so that people can understand exactly what a peacemaker is. And as you can see, when we go back to Matthew chapter 5, verses 9, again, I have blessed are the peacemakers. And a more accurate translation for people today, especially in America, will be nonviolent. So blessed are the nonviolent. And, and how do you define that? Being harmless to self and others under every condition. If you go to Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42, and say, You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, I talked about this in an earlier lesson, and that lesson is titled, Eye for, eye for an Eye. So if you haven't watched that lesson, it will complement this lesson. Um, but an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is a like our Constitution Amendment, our 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which prohibits the federal government from imposing excessive bail, excessive fines, or cruel and unusual punishment. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth means the same thing. It is an amendment given to the Israelites, and it's not to justify being cruel but is to limit the Israelites' cruelty. In other words, if you're going to punish people, don't impose excessive punishment. The punishment should fit the crime. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So that is what that means. We get to verse 39 and say, But I say unto you that you resist not evil. He's saying, Do not attempt attempt not to prevent it do not try to stop evil or seek worldly justice and we're going to explain that as we go through the lesson because I know that's hard for a lot of people to take in right now now I have this picture here for a second these diagrams and I will explain um, this in a second because when we go over the next scriptures, these um, diagrams will help you understand these next couple scriptures that I go over. Um, one second here. All right, there we go. Proverbs 20 and 22. It says, say not you, I will recompense evil. In other words, an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth. But wait on Yahashua and he shall defend you. So once again, when we go back to this scripture, when it say, but I say unto you, resist not evil. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to seek worldly justice our defender is Yahashua it says divers weights 
are an abomination unto Yahshua. This diver's rates mean stones. And basically what it's talking about is the weight is to weigh the scales of balance. It said trying to weigh the scales of balance are an abomination unto Yahashua. So don't try to defend yourself. Don't try to balance out justice. Yahashua will do it. If you go to Proverbs 20 and 10, it says, Diver, um, divers ways, which means weights, means rocks, and divers measures. This word measures come from ephah. And ephah means a dry measure. And now that is what I have this picture here for. Because if you, as you can see, and I'll zoom in here really quick, what an ephah is. So that is what I have this here for. And if you need to, um, you want to pause this video to go over this chart, you can just pause it. You can have it. You can screenshot it um, to um, save it if you like that chart. Use it for study. Um, so I'm going to zoom back out here really quick. It, and it's so um, it says so where we at um, rocks and uh, uh, dry measure it say both of them are alike abominations to Yahashua and a false balance is not good if you go to Ezekiel 25 and 10 it say ye shall have just balances and a just ephah and a just bath. Now it's the same thing. This word bath is talking about a particular weight. And as you can see here, it's talking about the weight of water. So we have uh, a dry powder used as a weight, and we have water being used as a weight. So Christ is saying, you shall have just balance. If you go to Proverbs 24 and 29. It says, say not, I will do so to him as he hath done to me. So that old amendment that the children of Israel had under the law of Moses, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, does not apply um, to people who are born again. It says, Yahashua will render to the man according to his work. So how do we um, have just balances and just weights? We let Yahashua render to every man according to his work. If you go to Romans 12, 17 through 21, it says recompense to no man evil for evil, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. It's a providing things honest. This word honest means free of injustice in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lie in you, live peaceably means free of conflict with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not. Do not inflict harm in return to defend your selves but rather give place unto wrath again resist not evil let them think they are getting away with it for it is written vengeance is mine I will repay said Yahashua therefore if thine enemy hunger Feed him if he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, ye shall heap coals of fire on his head. Now, what does this statement mean? Ye shall reap coals of fire on his head. If you go to Psalms 140 and 10, it say, Let burning coals fall upon them, let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. That they rise not up again. So again, 
vengeance is God's. Don't try to take vengeance into your own hand. You do not have to seek justice or worldly justice. Christ sees all, knows all, and will um, render to every man according to his deeds. Um, we are verse 21, Romans. Romans 12 and 21, it say, be not overcome with evil. In other words, don't try to overcome evil with evil, an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. It say, but overcome evil with good. And how do you overcome evil with good? Go back to verse 20. If thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, ye shall keep coals of fire on his head. We overcome evil with good. If you go to 1 Thessalonians um, 5 and 15, it says, See not, see that none render evil for evil. Again, that's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and and to all men. 1 Peter 3 and 9. Not rendering evil for evil. Or railing for railing. Even harsh words for harsh words. Don't render tick for tat. But counterize blessings. Knowing that ye are thereunto called. That ye should inherit a blessing. When people do you wrong and you bless them instead of curse them, you do good instead of evil. The scriptures say you are going to inherit a blessing. If you go back to Matthew chapter 5, we have verse 38 to 42. Again, it says, ye have heard that it have been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall slap you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. So now we're going to get into a more of an example. So he said, if somebody slap you, give him the other cheek also. If you go to 1 Peter 2 and 20, it say, for what glory is it if when you be buffeted, this word buffeted means strike with the fist so what glory is it if when you are striked with the fist punched for your faults for the things you did wrong you take it patiently so in other words it's saying when you get hit because you did something wrong you accept it but when you do well and suffer for it you take it patiently Say, this is acceptable unto God. So in other words, even if you do something right where you didn't do anything wrong and somebody punish you anyway, the scriptures are saying, take it patiently as if you did something wrong because this is acceptable unto God. If you go to Matthew chapter 26 and verse 67, it says, it says, then did they spit in his face and punched him and others slapped him with the palms of their hands, saying, prophesy unto us, you Christ, who is he that slapped you? Now, if you go to Lamentations 3 and 30, it gives this prophecy. It says, he giveth his cheeks to him that hit him. He is filled with full with reproach and that is what we're just reading in, in Matthew chapter 26 and 27 so this is Christ being punched slapped spit on and being reproached mocked made fun of say and if any man will sue thee at the law which means sue you in court and take away your shirt let him have your jacket also. 
So turn the other cheek. If someone sue you, he wants your shirt, give him your jacket also. This is, we're defining what the scriptures mean when it says peacemaker. And this is what a peacemaker is. If you go to 1 Corinthians 6, this um, section of scriptures talks about lawsuits among believers. It says, dare any of you having a matter against another go to court before the unjust? Now we're getting into a little bit of why he's talking about do not seek worldly justice. Because the problem with seeking worldly justice is that the world is evil. The so-called judges and the so-called justice system, there is nothing just about it in any way, shape or form. God have not appointed these judges to judge. These people are oppressors, not judges. They have twist judgment. They care nothing about righteousness or equality. They only care about money. And they are designed to profit off of your conflicts. So say, have a matter against a brother, go to, car, go, to, go to court before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, talking about the saints, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that ye shall judge angels? How much more than that pertaining to this life? I want to read verse 4 in the King James Version translation, then I will read how I translated it. It says, If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. So in other words, if then, you are judges of these things pertaining to this life. In other words, you shall judge the wicked, you shall judge angels. It say, appoint them to judge which are not despised in the church. Humble people. If you have Acts 6 and 3, they give a better definition or they say it in a better way than um, verse 4. Acts 6 through say, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom ye may appoint over this business. And as saints, this is what we should do. We should not be suing people civilly or pressing criminal charges against anybody. The scripture says, vengeance is mine, said the Lord, I will recompense. Verse 5, I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, no, not one, that shall be able to judge between his brethren? But brother, go to court with brother or against brother? And that before the unbelievers. So once again, he's letting you know that these people, the civil system, they are unjust and unbelievers. So why are you putting faith in them for justice? John chapter 19 verses 10 through 11. It says, then said Pilate unto him, he's speaking to Yahashua. He says, speak you not unto me? Know you not that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Yahashua answered and said, this is what Yahashua said, you possess no authority nor jurisdiction over me except it were given you from above. The rulers of this world 
possess no jurisdiction over us. Their unrighteous judgment doesn't mean anything. It is not judgment. It is oppression. And this is why the scriptures say, when you go back to Proverbs, diverse weights are an abomination unto Yahashua. Because the weights and the balances of this world are corrupt and are an abomination. We have verse 7. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because you go to court one with another. Go to court, suing each other in court. Why do you not rather take wrong? We're going to go to 1 Peter. Uh, we already ran over 1 Peter 2 and 20, but we're going to go over 19, then 21 through 23. So in other words, to say, why do you not rather take wrong? For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Again, it, this is acceptable unto God to suffer for things you did not do wrong. For even hereunto were you called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow after his steps. Who did no sin, neither was Gal found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. He did not physically or verbally defend himself, but committed himself to him that judge righteously. And if we are saints and call ourselves the children of God, we should follow Christ's example. Turn the other cheek. Do not argue with these people. Do not debate with these people. Suffer yourself to be defrauded. Take wrong. It say, why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Suffer yourselves to be robbed. Let them take away your coat. Let them take away your jacket. Let them take away all of these material things. Let them take away your money. Why? Let them think they're getting away with something. Because we know that everything in this world shall be destroyed. It will not last forever. It will be taken away anyway. So let them have it. The things that they take cannot keep you out of heaven. Neither can the things that they take get them into heaven. Matthew chapter 5. This section of scriptures is, no, um, is known as anger and reconciliation. So ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, ye shall not kill. In other words, ye shall not murder. And whosoever shall murder shall be in danger of judgment. Um, this word judgment means when the spiritual body is destroyed in hell. If you go to Matthew 10 and 28, it say, fear not them which kill the body. And we're going to come back to verse 28. Because right now, right now, I'm going to explain what it means when it say, um, Whosoever, this part where it says, shall be in danger of judgment. I want to explain this with scripture so you understand. Because I said, when the spiritual body is destroyed in hell. So fear not them which can kill the body. Ecclesiastes 7 and 1 says, a good man 
In other words, doing what right, doing what is right, is better than precious ornament. Talking about riches, so a good name is better than riches. Hebrews eleven twenty five. This is talking about Moses. He said he choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God a good name, then enjoy the pleasures of riches for a season. Now I'm just jumping back to Ecclesiastes 7 and 1. It is saying, And the day of death, then the day of one's birth. So he's saying a good name is better than riches, and the day of death um is better than the day of birth. Philippians 1, 20-24. They say, For I am straight confused. He says he's confused between do two different things. He said, Having a desire to depart, to mount die, and to be with Christ, which is far better. Death is better than birth. He said, Nevertheless, this is why you're confused. Um, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Psalms 116 and 15. It says, Precious is the sight. Precious is the sight of Yod Hey Vav Hey is the death of his saints. So Christ in the in our saints, it says when in the scriptures it says, when the saints die. It is precious in the sight of God. And why? Go to 1 Corinthians 15, 42, 44. Because not only is your death precious, it says, see also is the resurrection of the dead. Your resurrection is precious. It say it is sown, which means it die in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So this is why death is better than birth. And why the death of the saints is precious in the sight of Yahshua. You go to Matthew chapter 10 verse 28. And, says, and fear not them which can kill the body talking about the natural body but are not able to kill the spiritual body but rather fear him which is able to destroy both the spiritual body and the natural body in hell and that is what that this is what that judgment is so shall be in danger of judgment. That danger of judgment is when the spiritual body and natural body is destroyed in the lake of fire. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry at his brother without a, without a cause. Now this word when it say is angry at his brother without a cause. It means unjustly. You are angry at your brother unjustly. And it means has it, there is it is not based on behavior that transgressed against you shall be in danger of hell fire, being that spiritual body being destroyed in the lake of fire. So, what are, this next group of scriptures is so you to help you understand what it means. When it says, whosoever is angry at his brother without just cause. If you go to Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, it says, moreover, if your brother shall trespass against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone first. If he shall hear you, if he says, say sorry or ask for forgiveness, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, then take one or two more, that at the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. 
And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. Who is the church? The church. He ain't say go to the police. He ain't say go to civil court. He said go to the church. Because the church, the saints will be appointed to judge the world. But if he neglect to heal the church, let him be unto you as a heathen man and a public. Anything other than this in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17 is unjust reason to be angry at your brother. Anything besides this is angry with his brother without a cause. And if you are angry at your brother without a cause, you are in danger of judgment. The scripture says, and whosoever shall say unto his brother, Raka, which means fool, idiot, dummy. In other words, to speak with disrespect or scornful abuse shall be in danger of the council. And who is the council? It says, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? But whosoever shall say, you fool. You ungodly, you heretic, go to hell. Same thing, disrespect or scornful abuse shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother have something against you, leave there your gift before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother. What? How do you be reconciled to your brother? Right here, Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. Moreover, if your brother shall trespass against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. Or if you have done something to your brother, go and apologize. Then bring your gift to the altar. Be reconciled to your brother first. Agree with thine adversary quickly. While you are in the way with him, at least at any time the adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge deliver you to the officer, talking about the sheriff or the bailiff. That's so you can understand that that's terminology for today's term in America. And you be cast into jail. Verily, I say unto you, ye shall by no means come out, come out hence till ye have paid the uttermost farthing. Which means the last penny. You go have to pay something. The system is designed to make profit off of conflict. Not seek justice. Luke 12 and 57 says, Yes, why even of yourself judge you not what is right? When you go with thine adversary to the magistrate, as you are in the way, give diligence, means pay, pay close attention, that you might be delivered from him. At least he haul you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer, and the officer cast you into jail. I tell you, ye shall not depart hence till you has paid the very last penny in other words agree with thine adversary quickly suffer yourself to be defrauded we live in an unjust world and we are going to be treated unjustly don't fight against it don't defend yourself God will defend you Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. I will recompense. Going back to Matthew 5 and 9. So again, blessed are the peacemakers. For they, talking about those that overcome evil with good, shall be called the children of God. Everything that I just read above here. All of this here. If you are not doing this stuff, you are not going to be called a child of God. Children of God obey the scriptures. 
They're going to be peacemakers, nonviolent. If they have a problem with somebody, they're going to go to their brother first. And if their brother don't hear, get two or three other saints so that the so that every word shall be established. And if they still don't hear, then go to the judge. And who are our judge? Our judge are the elders of the church. People who love God. And if you don't have elders of the church that you can go to, suffer yourself to be defrauded, that the will of God may be so. God will give unto every man according to a deed. Just suffer yourself to be defrauded like Christ did. Go to Matthew chapter 5, 43 to 48. Ye have heard that it have been said, Ye shall love your neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemy. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which falsely accuse and persecute you. This is how you overcome evil with good. Saints of God do not try to overcome evil with evil. You overcome evil with good. Matthew 24, 9, it says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. This is talking about persecution now. Falsely accused and persecuted. Because I want you to understand, Christ lets you know what's going to happen to saints on this planet. It says, Then. So they deliver you up to be afflicted and persecuted and shall kill you. But what did we just read about? Fear not them which kill the body, but after that do nothing. They're not getting away with anything. You have another life, another body that is going to last forever. It said, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Revelation um, chapter 2 verses 10 through 11 and say fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer behold the devil shall cast some of you into jail that ye may be tried and ye shall have tribulation to persecution and affliction 10 days be you faithful unto death and Yahashua will give you a crown of life he that had an ear let him hear what the spirit say unto the churches to the saints he that overcome overcome good i mean overcome evil with good shall not be hurt of the second death they will not be burned in hell fire you have to overcome evil with good that ye may be the children of your father, which is in heaven. This is Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed, in other words, great is your reward in heaven. For they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When you have done no wrong and you are persecuted, and killed for it. Great is your reward in heaven. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. You will inherit eternal life. You have to overcome evil with good. If we're going to read Genesis chapter 37, and we're going to go through a couple of verses here. Uh, to bring, try to bring this all home so we can understand and have a visual picture of what it means to be persecuted for righteousness sake. So if you go to Genesis chapter 37, um, we're going to start off with um, verses 1 through 4. It says, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old was feeding the flock with his brethren and the lad was with the sons of Balah. And with the sons of Zappa, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. 
Now Israel loved Joseph more than all the ch more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated Joseph and could not speak peaceably unto him. Again, remember, whosoever shall call his brother Raka or fool, if you cannot speak peaceably of your brother, you are in danger of hell fire. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near, now I, I jumped to, from verse four to verse eighteen to just pull. Out, I'm just pulling out the important stuff about the story of Joseph for time's sake. If you want to read the whole story, just go to back to the book of Genesis, start at chapter thirty-seven, and read all the way through um, the end of Genesis. So again, and when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said unto one another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us kill him, and cast him into some pit. And we will, and we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him. And we shall see what shall become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood. But cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that um, he might rid him of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And it come to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, um, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. In other words, a well. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Glad with their camels bearing um, spicery and bombs and myrrh, going to, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come. Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers were content. They agreed with him. Then they pa then there passed by Midianites, merchant men, and they drew and lift up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now we're going to Genesis 37 and we're going to start at 31. And they took Joseph's coat, the coat of many colors, and they killed a kid of the goats. In other words, a kid of a goat just meant a young goat. And dipped the uh, coat in the blood and they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat, and evil beasts have to devour him. Joseph hath been without doubt um, tore in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his sons many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, I will go down into my grave unto my son's mourning. Thus his father wept for him, and the Midianites sold Joseph into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, and captain of the guard. Now from here we just finna jump to Genesis chapter 39, Joseph and Potiphar's wife. And Joseph was brought down into Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down to Egypt. And Yahashua was with Joseph, and he was pro and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the in the house of his master the Egyptian. And his master saw that Yahashua was with him, and that Yahashua made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found great in the and Joseph found grace in the sight and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had put unto his hand. 
And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer of his house. So over his house and over all that he had, that Yahashua blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sakes. And the blessings of Yahashua was upon all that he had in the house and it and it and in the field. And he left all that he and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew um not nothing he had save the bread which he did eat. In other words, he he trusted Joseph with everything. He wasn't concerned about how much he had, how little he knew Joseph was going to have keep everything in order. He had no worries. And it say, and Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. So in other words, we can see Joseph being a child of God, had favor with his daddy, and his brothers hated him for that. Here he has favor, even sold into slavery, he has favor with Pharaoh. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife, cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, lie with me. In other words, she was trying to have Joseph commit adultery. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanted it not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in the house than I, neither hath he kept back anything for me but you. Because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass as she spoke to Joseph day by day. In other words, she kept trying to get Joseph to commit adultery. That And he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garments, saying, Lie with me. And he lift, left his garments in her hand and fled and go and got him out. He ran out. We still at in Genesis 39, verse 13. And it came to pass. When she saw that he had lift, left his garments in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of the house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garments with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which you have brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garments with me and fled out. And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did your servant to me, that his wrath was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners was bound, and he was there in prison. So again, Joseph did nothing. He did nothing wrong to his brothers. He did nothing wrong to Potiphar's wife, but yet they accused him falsely and persecuted him. Go to Genesis 41. This is just talk about eventually Joseph um, is given charge over Egypt. They say, and things was good in the eyes of Pharaoh's and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find such a one? As this one, a man in whom the Spirit of God is. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according unto um, your word shall all my people be ruled. He, Joseph ruled Egypt. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. He was second in command, vice president. 
And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it onto Joseph's hand and arrayed them in um, clothing and fine linen and put gold chains about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they, and they cried before him, bowed the knee, and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh's king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Like I said, you wanna, if you want to read the whole story, you just have to go to um, the book of Genesis and read through the whole story. I'm just putting out. Um, certain scriptures so I can get to the point. And now we in Genesis 50. Let's talk about Joseph comfort his brothers. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will um, eventually hate us and will certainly require us, require from us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a message unto Joseph saying, um, your father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of your brother and their sins, for they did unto you evil. And now we pray you, forgive the trespasses of thy servants of the God of your father. And Joseph cried when they spake unto him. And his brother also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be your servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in the place of God. In other words, God put me here. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. To bring to pass as it is this day. Do not seek worldly justice. God will come and defend you. Do not render evil for evil or tick for tat and eye for an eye or tooth for tooth. Do not seek to defend yourself. The evil that people do to you is part of God's greater plan. Let it happen. He said, God meant it unto good to bring to pass at, as it is this day to save much people alive. Now, therefore, fear ye not. I will nourish you. If thy enemies hunger, feed them and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly, not calling his brothers raka or fool. Even after what they did to him, he spake kindly unto them. Romans 8 and 28 verses 30 say, and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God. To them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did. For whom he did foreknew. He also did predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestined them, he also called. And whom he called them, he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. If you want to understand this section of scripture more in depth, I did a study called True Disciples and Apostles. You have to just go back and watch that study. But again, all things, even the evil that people do in this world, do to you, do to the saints, work together for the good of them that love God. In the end, 
If you be the peacemaker, trust God and keep his word, you will be fine. God will use you to save much people alive. Matthew 5 verses 11. It says, blessed, great is your reward in heaven are those ye men shall revalue you and shall persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely falsely accuse you just like they did Joseph for my sake rejoice don't get sad don't start thinking you have to defend yourself protect yourself or render an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth get vengeance it says rejoice ye saints and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they, this wicked world, persecuted the prophets which were before you. And this concludes this gospel.